Okay, we are in Acts chapter 14, and LR did a good job in covering Acts 12 and Acts 13. And now we're going to come to this portion of Acts, and it looks like we will just have a few more classes on this, and then we're going to uh, suspend other classes, obviously, and have just that one auditorium class, but I'm really looking forward to that especially on the resurrection of Christ. I know that uh, Matt and Stephen are going to do a really good job with that. So we'll get through as much as we can through Acts, these next uh, couple of classes, and, um, you know, just uh, try and cover as much as we can. Now, this portion of Acts is uh, going over what we consider the first missionary journey of Paul. And let me see if I can kind of share this to give us a good reminder of, of what's happening here in this context. Um, let me see here. Okay. You can uh, see it. Here's a, there's various maps you can get on this. Um, this is a really, I like this. This is a real good colorful one, but it has the first and second, and we're looking just primarily at the first one here. And we understand that it started there at Antioch of Syria, and that's where the Spirit separated Paul and Barnabas, Saul and Barnabas, for this task, this work, and they were commissioned from that church. I mean, they laid their hands on them in the sense of endorsement and fellowship. And so they began this journey. They went through Cyprus as uh, LR covered. And they came through Perga, Pamphylia, which is where John Mark left them. And then they continued to go up through Antioch uh, in Pisidia there, as you can see on the map. And then what we'll see is by the end of Acts 14, they've made this trip all through the Galatia area. And they get back to Antioch of Syria. And it's roughly from the years 45 to 47, just two years two-year span, roughly, of them going through this area, establishing churches, appointing elders in those churches, which is a very important development. And then he gets back to Antioch, and then he writes the letter to the Galatian brethren. And that's why he starts out by saying, I just can't believe you so quickly, you know, quickly departed from what we uh, taught you. And so he's going through that with them. But we can see uh, so far, like I said, if you look a little bit closer, uh, LR did cover the, the efforts there in Acts 13, which dealt with Paphos and, you know, all, all there in Cyprus to Antioch of Pisidia and the conflict that was there. And that's how it ends there in Acts 13 is that conflict there at Antioch. And so they go down or they go over to Iconium. After that, at the end of Acts 13, they, uh, verse 51, they shook the dust off their feet and came to Iconium, and the disciples were filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. That's how Acts 13 ends. And what we'll see in Acts 14 is that he camps out in this area. The Galatian brethren is what we would know them as later. But they, um, you know, the, the, these series of churches here, they're all grouped together, Iconium, Lystra, and Derby, and they have a front row seat to a lot of activity in Paul's ministry, and some very significant events take place uh, in this ministry, especially with the people he converts there at Iconium, Lystra, and Derby, uh, people who were won to the Lord through the gospel, and he ended up He's going to come back through there on his second missionary journey, and he's going to be able to pick up somebody whose mother was converted from this period, and he eventually would be converted as well, and it's referring to Timothy. So as a result of what Paul's doing here in his first missionary journey, he's laying good groundwork, converting a lot of people, but he's suffering some intense persecution. Nevertheless, it creates good opportunity for some serious uh, workers of the Lord to be converted. <laughs> and we we can see that a little bit more detail here uh, in this first first trip. 
And then, like I said, it's going to end at the end of chapter 14 with them getting back to Antioch and just staying there for a long period of time is what it says in verse 28 of Acts 14. But so hopefully when we think of Acts 13 and Acts 14, we're thinking the first missionary journey of Paul, which had Barnabas with him. So that's a good way of remembering these two chapters. But they did leave Antioch, okay, and they're going to Iconium. They go to the synagogue of the Jews, 14 and verse 1, and they spoke, uh, that a, they spoke that a great multitude, both of the Jews and of the Greeks, believed, but the unbelieving Jews stirred up the Gentiles and poisoned their minds against them. So just go ahead and remember all this because I'm going to end this, uh, the map, at least the sharing. So, But I wanted to give you an idea of... Um, where we were, what part of the world, and uh, you know how these uh, churches are all cities are all clumped together. But here he is; he's he's at Iconium, going to the synagogue of the Jews, which was his, t you know, his tendency was to go where these people who feared God were gathering, and he would address them. And many of those believed. It says of the Jews and of the Greeks believe. So that has already been a, a, ten, a tendency as well, a trend of people being converted from both classes of people, races of people, and that's what's happening here. And you had the God-fearing Greeks, like Cornelius, you know, here that was a he was a God-fearer. And you had those throughout the world, and here in the Galatian area. You had Greeks like that who would fear God and who would eventually believe. But in verse 2, the unbelieving Jews stirred up the Gentiles and poisoned their minds against the brethren. So you still have that section of Judaism. You know, these Jews who were going to do all that they could to resist Paul, to silence Paul, and to contain him to minimize his efforts and that's what's happening here and it says that they stirred up the gentiles and poisoned their minds and what what do you think that means they poisoned their minds why would it be why would it be referred to that way how do you poison someone's mind that's some pretty graphic language if you think about it you know they came in and they poisoned their minds against against the brethren. And I think it gets back to the idea of being able to corrupt somebody's thinking, obviously. Um, well, Proverbs says that the, uh, what is it? The whisperer separates the best of friends. You might remember that verse, you know, and that just is an example of how, you know, we can say things to manipulate a person's thoughts against somebody you know, is what that refers to. And that's what's happening here. You had these unbelieving Jews who weren't going to be persuaded with the gospel, and they weren't content with not believing. They were aggressively trying to, you know, to oppose the brethren and oppose Paul. And so they were able to say things, to manipulate the people's thinking, you know, to convince them to reject the gospel reject Christianity, and it was all it was all a result of manipulation. I mean, that's just a, the perfect word for it, you know, because they poisoned their minds, they corrupted their thinking against people. So we have that ability, you know, we have the ability to influence people's thoughts, and we have the ability to have our thoughts influenced by certain people or certain commentary, whatever it might be. But it says they stayed there a long time speaking boldly in the Lord. So they didn't back down. You know, Paul at this point didn't back down. He continued to stay there at Iconium and preached with all courage. And the Lord was bearing witness to the word of his grace, granting signs and wonders to be done by their hands. So, you know, the miracles were there to confirm who was of God and who was of not, you know, who was the actual chosen representative teaching God's will, but it, it wasn't a slam dunk. You know, it wasn't guaranteed to convince people to obey the gospel, because you see here that that didn't win everybody. But 
the people who were sincere and honest could see the truth and they could put two and two together and, and they were willing to believe and conform and convert to Christianity. And so it says, though, in verse 4, the multitude of the city was divided, part sided with the Jews and part with the apostles. So apparently the Jews had some argument to counter the gospel, you know, and they had something they were saying that was enough to persuade people not to be followers of Jesus Christ through the apostles. Now, obviously, it's interesting that Paul and Barnabas are both referred to as apostles here, even though Barnabas was never called out or sent directly by Jesus, at least. He wasn't ever selected to be one of his chosen ones sent out among the 12, you know, which we see happening in uh, Matthew 10 and then Acts 1, you know, when Judas was replaced. Uh, and yet Barnabas is uh, referred to as an apostle here. And so what sense could he have been referred to as an apostle? What do you think that's referring to? How can you reconcile that with, you know, the apostles of Jesus Christ? Okay, and we understand that the, the term apostle is one cent, right? You know, and um, when the apostles of Jesus Christ were chosen, you know, you had to have somebody who was a witness of the resurrection. Acts 1 is talking about that. And there's no indication that Barnabas was ever selected to be one of those 12, you know, to be a witness of the resurrection. Um, but it could obviously refer to, in a general sense, the term. Apostle can refer to anyone who was sent. And they were sent out. Saul and Barnabas at this point, they were sent out by the Spirit, you know, or by even the, the church at Antioch. You can see that at, at Acts 13, the first part of that chapter. And so they were sent out on this mission, and in that sense, they were apostles. Uh, you know, I, I likened it to the term uh, minister. You know, sometimes in the New Testament, minister refers to the preacher, you know, fulfill your ministry. Uh, be a good minister of the things, you know, that were given to you as what was said to preachers. And yet, in a general sense, we all can be ministers and need to be ministers as Christians, you know, as servants, uh, those who are given to um, any type of devotion. Um, you can be a, a minister. First Peter chapter 4, and verse 10, we got to be ministers of the gifts that God gives us. Matthew 25, 44 talks about ministering to those in need, okay? But it's separate from a minister, you know, which is, can be used in a, another context of just speaking of the preacher or the evangelist. Well, I, I think the term apostle is used like that in the New Testament. You know, in this case, it's used in a general sense of uh, Paul and Barnabas being sent out, um, distinguished, of course, from the apostles of Jesus Christ who were chosen by him. The Lord sent them out for that specific work. All right, so that's my understanding. Any thoughts or comments on that? You know, there are religions today that claim that you still have apostles, that you have to have 12 apostles even today, and that it's impossible to have the apostles of Jesus Christ because obviously nobody's a witness of his resurrection today. So that you know, that's not, that's not consistent with the New Testament to say that. All right, so that's what's happening here. The, the, the city's divided, some with the Jews, some with the apostles, and there was a violent attempt made in verse 5 by the Gentiles and Jews with their rulers to abuse and stone them. Again, it wasn't enough to just disagree. They had to kill. They felt like they had to kill Paul and Barnabas, and really Paul seems to be the more outspoken one in this context, and so he's especially a threat to them. Well, it says they became aware of it, and they fled to Lystra and Derbe, cities of Lyconia, and to the surrounding region. So we, you know, see from that map that these are all cities in an, in an area, and so he's, he's leaving Iconium, but he's still preaching, and he's still promoting this gospel and it says that they came to Lystra in verse 8, and they were doing uh, the work there as well. 
And we see what happens here in Leicester and people being converted. Anything so far? Any comments, questions you want to add to? Okay. Well, he comes to Lystra, and it says uh, in verse 8 that a certain man without strength in his feet was sitting, a cripple from his mother's womb who had never walked. So we've seen this before, you know, people in the New Testament being lame from birth. And here's another one. And what do you know? It says in verse 9, this man heard Paul speaking, Paul observing him intently and seeing that he had faith to be healed, said with a loud voice, stand up straight on your feet. And he leaped and walked. That, <laughs> that had to be a, an amazing sight to witness because you know this guy's legs were just, just skin and bone. I mean, there was no muscle to them, never walked a day in his life. So you just had these, you know, just legs with no strength whatsoever. And yet this man is not, he's not pulling himself up and all wobbly, you know, trying to, trying to learn how to take a first step or two. He, he leaps up. I've been walking all my life and I don't, I can probably count on one hand the times I've leaped up from anything. <laughs> it just doesn't happen that much in, in my regime, but uh, it did this day. This guy leaped up leaped up and was walking and the people saw that and they of course were saying that the gods were were present um you know but it does say that he paul could see that this man had the faith to be healed now some people will run with that you know some religions that claim to do modern day healing they'll say if you're not healed it's because you didn't have enough faith you know if you have enough faith you would be healed and they'll come to verses like that, this, and say that. And obviously, you can look in the book of Acts even as a whole and see that, yeah, Paul could see this man had faith, but there are many, 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 many times over when people did not have faith and they were healed. I mean, how could you cast out demons like they were doing? <laughs> you know, those people didn't have faith, and yet the uh, Lord and his apostles were able to cast out demons you can see that all throughout the book of Acts, or even in Acts 3, you know, where Peter, the other lame man, you know, who was begging, and he looked at Peter expecting a handout, and Peter healed him that day, you know, and it had nothing to do with that man's faith whatsoever, or raising people from the dead, you know, there's just, it's not a, it's just not an absolute rule to say that you have to have faith to be healed, because that's just not the case. Paul could see that this man had faith, and it, that may just be a sidebar. I mean, it may not be anything more than just making the observation that this man had faith. Regardless, he was healed, okay, and a real authentic miracle was performed. And if this was still around the day, well, <laughs> I mean, look, we wouldn't have this virus in the world threatening so many people. I mean, this would have been a perfect platform for somebody to stand up and say, look, you know, we have the ability to heal miraculously because, hey, here it is. And, but that's not happening. And the world knows it's not happening, uh, especially with what's happened recently. Well, anyway, it happened here, and the people saw this, and they lost their mind, okay? They were Convinced that the gods have come down to us in the likeness of men, it says in verse 11. Now, I did read elsewhere that there was that belief that that had actually happened prior to this. You know, these gods had taken human form, and that was just a, that was a legend at that time. And so these people, it was already in their belief system, and they thought it was happening again with Paul and Barnabas. And so they thought the gods were present. Barnabas they called Zeus in verse 12, and Paul Hermes because he was the chief speaker, which kind of gets back to, you know, going back to the apostles. I mean, one of the reasons Paul would have been the chief speaker is because he was an actual witness of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, I would think, is why he would be uh, one of the chief speakers. Um, regardless, he's the one doing the most talking and the most teaching. And so they're worshiping them as Zeus and Hermes. And so the priest of Zeus, whose temple was in front of their city, 
brought oxen and garlands to the gates, intending to sacrifice with the multitudes. Now, you know, you think about that today. If there were certain evangelists or certain ministers and teachers who were about to be lavished with gifts and worshiped and praised, you know, they would eat that up. You know, and they want that. There are men who want that, that kind of power over people. Well, Paul and Barnabas had a perfect opportunity to receive that type of treatment from people. And yet we see that as people were about to sacrifice to them, Paul, the apostles, Barnabas and Paul, heard this. They tore their clothes and ran in among the multitude, crying out, saying, men, what, why are you doing these things? Now, what did it mean for them to tear their clothes? What, what was that expressing for them to do that? Any thoughts on that? What, you know, when you think of somebody tearing their clothes as a, res, you know, a response to something, generally it can refer to somebody who is angry. You know, you can see that through the, the Bible of various times when, uh, well, the high priest, you know, even with Jesus's trial, uh, he tore his clothes. You know, obviously it was a, a response of, of rage and, and anger towards something. And I think that may be an element here. I mean, they're, they're just so, they're just so upset and um, opposed to what these people were doing. And that I think that was a demonstration for them to see, look, this is not how you're supposed to view us. This is, this is not what you're supposed to do to, to fellow men. You're not supposed to worship them, is what Paul is trying to get them to say. See, is what are you doing? Why are you doing these things? We're just people like you. We're just men. We're just humans. In verse uh, 15, we are also men with the same nature as you. What, we're not gods. And so we were sent to preach to you that you should turn from these useless things to the living God who made the heaven, the earth, the sea, and all things that are in them. So, I mean, I, you know, Jesus turned the temple upside down. You know, he cleaned it out in his anger toward those who were corrupting it. And I can see that same type of emotion here from Paul, you know, the anger toward them in, in viewing people like this, let alone Paul and Barnabas like this. That you are, these are useless things, okay? These things are dumb, <laughs> is what he's basically saying. There is nothing to worship here, as far as humans are concerned, that we are to worship God, the living God, who made everything. That's the one we're supposed to worship, who in bygone generations allowed all nations to walk in their own ways. That's talking about his patience, obviously. Nevertheless, he did not leave himself without witness in that he did good gave us rain from heaven, fruitful seasons, filling our hearts with food and glad gladness. And so he's trying to get them to realize, look, we're nothing. The real giver of all things, he's the one who's been giving us things since day one, our, our entire life. He's the one we're supposed to worship. And again, I think that's a, a good way of looking at God, of praising God, you know, that we need to be people who praise him for all we are eating today because of God's mercy. You know, we have food, we have life, we have seasons. We have, he's the, the giver and sustainer of life. It's an appropriate belief, you know, for us to praise God for being such a generous giver and creator in all that we have. But that's what he's trying to get them to do. He's trying to direct their thoughts to this belief and it, it says in verse 18, with these things, they could scarcely restrain the multitudes from sacrificing to them. So it did very little in persuading them. They were all bent out of shape on emotion, and that's what's captured them at this point. And so you know, Paul had no chance of convincing them. And that's true. Once a person gets to the stage of emotion and they're letting emotion run wild, but you can't reason and you can't uh, convince them otherwise. <clears throat> and so we see that happening here. Anything else on that text? Any thoughts or observations you want to make? Um, 
about these people from Lystra who are worshiping Paul and Barnabas like this. You know, and I could, again, I commend these men for having the humility, sincerity to uh, respond this way and to not let people worship them like this. Okay. Um, it's almost, well, it is 930. Yeah, it's 930. Okay. And I know we got to get the services here. So we'll just stop right there and then we'll pick up uh, Lord willing on uh, Wednesday night on verse 19. Okay. Anything you want to add? Okay. Thank you, brethren. Appreciate you very much. We'll see you in a little bit. Thank you. Take care.